wanted to say. Uh, even though we disagree, I really appreciate your show. Uh, it's, I think it's really important, especially for us as Christians, to understand the objections and to think critically about what we believe and why we believe it. And I think you do a really good job promoting that. So I just want to right. thank you for that. Thank you very much. So, yeah, so my question basically has to do with uh, the resurrection and okay. the evidence um, for the resurrection. I guess maybe a good question I'd have to start off with is how we approach an event. So I take the position that if all plausible natural explanations um, for an event have very severe issues with them, then it is reasonable to infer a supernatural explanation. And I disagree with that. Would you? I do too. Okay. Um, so, would you say that even if we, even if continuously naturalistic hypotheses are formulated, and they continue to be challenged or refuted, you do not think that provides any evidence at all, or would you consider that? Some, some it's, evidence? it's just evidence that the previous hypotheses have, are were not correct. Okay. Um, so, in that case, what I what I would ask then would be, what level of evidence would be necessary for you to conclude that a supernatural event has occurred? Um. You would have to demonstrate that supernatural even exists. I mean, I, I'm not even sure how you get there from here because, by definition, you're claiming that that something that would basically upend everything we know about how the world works would have to be okay, true. This might, yeah, this might be a good uh, uh, place to start off with. So it sounds like what you're saying is that to believe in the supernatural would require us to have a radical uh, re-understanding of what the cosmos is. Is that, am I accurately? Well, essentially uh, nothing that we know about the natural world makes sense anymore. Okay, uh, this is where I would have to disagree. Um, so under a Christian worldview, um, I'd ex I would say that uh, the universe, the fact that the universe is governed normally by natural laws makes perfect sense. So this is because in the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says in the beginning was the Word. Um, and I think that is very consistent with the fact that we see laws governing the various fundamental forces, which can be described mathematically. I think that's very consistent with the, with the idea of a God literally called Logos uh, that it's upholds the universe in a logical and consistent manner. It's also question, consistent miracle, with there not being a God at all, though. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree that it can it can be consistent either with naturalism or with theism. But my point is that um, I don't believe that miracles would radically uh, change our understanding of the cosmos. I think that under a theistic framework, all that would show is that there is a God who constantly upholds the universe through these natural laws, but who occasionally acts and overpowers them uh, because he he is the one who's ultimately in power. But I don't think that would require us to abandon those physical laws. Okay, but you had a specific right. you had a specific supernatural event you wanted to talk about, namely the resurrection. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we could go maybe towards that. So I guess my point is maybe just to go into a more concrete thing. Here's basically the facts that a consensus of New Testament scholars agree upon. So these facts are that uh, Jesus Christ existed. Uh, that he had disciples, uh, that Jesus was crucified, that the disciples' lives were significantly changed uh, after the crucifixion, that they believed they saw Jesus uh, risen from the dead. And there's not quite as strong a, a consensus on this fact, but uh, most scholars, including many uh, agnostics, who also would agree that Jesus' tomb was found empty um, three days later. So in light of these facts, um, and in light of the fact that we have a lot of sources which indicate that disciples were uh, martyred um, proclaiming uh, Jesus, including proclaiming the resurrection, 
Um, I'd argue that this gives us grounds to infer in high probability uh, a supernatural God. And specifically, this is because there are many naturalistic hypotheses which have been put forward to explain uh, uh, this data, uh, which have since been refuted. So a couple examples are the idea that Jesus didn't die, uh, further advances in medical science, um, uh, it should basically have made this pretty much uncontestable as uh, numerous sources. Uh, for instance, well, no, nobody here is arguing that, okay? I mean, you're claiming, you made several specific claims here that Jesus existed, that he was crucified, that his tomb was found empty, okay? That's right. I, I'm I'm on the fence about whether or not Jesus even existed, whether there was a, like one individual named Jesus or something similar, who is the source of this mythology. Okay. Okay. Um, and as to whether he was crucified, crucifixion was a rather common event back then. Yeah, that's not particularly so, extraordinary. Nothing yeah. extraordinary about that. And I would, I would further say that the people who were crucified died. So I have no dispute there. So if you, if there was some guy that, for whatever reason, they said, okay, we're going to crucify this guy, and later the name Jesus got attached to that guy, I agree he died. Okay, that his tomb was found empty. Well. Um, so what? Okay, so the, um, the, so a couple points. First, um, I would say that with respect to the existence of Jesus, there's a very strong um, scholarly consensus. I don't know if you know who Bart Ehrman is, but he's a pretty famous agnostic New Testament scholar. Yes, I'm aware. It's historic, and he said it's basically historically certain. It's that Jesus existed. Um, now, with respect to the empty tomb, the reason that I think the empty tomb is important is that um, no matter who you are, whether you're an atheist or a Christian, you have to account for the, basically the following is that there's reports of an empty tomb um, that, um, and there's reports of um, basically the disciples believing that they saw Jesus after he died. Um, so on that basis, there have been uh, multiple attempts by those who do not believe in the resurrection uh, to explain this data. Um, so one of the examples I gave already was that Jesus didn't die. Um, but there were others such as uh, the idea of group hallucinations or the idea that um, the disciples stole the body uh, or that the guards uh, were somehow involved in a conspiracy. And essentially, my point was that uh, as New Testament scholars have done more study, there's a growing consensus um, around the basic facts, such as the empty tomb, and that there are issues with many of the theories, such as group hallucinations, being quite uncommon, especially after a tragic event. Um, and with respect to the disciples stealing the body, you have to account for the many reports of martyrdom uh, and the persecution of Christians. No, I've never uh, yeah. found I've never found that argument to be particularly compelling because people a lot we've we've had lots of people martyr themselves over their religious beliefs. The people who flew the airplanes into the twin towers martyred themselves. Yeah. Um, that's not a good way to determine whether something re is really true or not. I agree, but the difference here is that unlike in the case of uh, the martyrs who are the terrorists, they were not in a position to know whether or not Islam was true. They were oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. They believe that it is, just as you believe what the, what you're claiming is true. Yes, no, I agree that I would be in the same position as them, but the thing is the original disciples were in a completely different position. My point was that any assuming, uh, naturalistic acts... Assuming there were original disciples. Yeah, yes, but that that is generally agreed upon by historians, but... No, for but the so original sure disciples that. who yeah. saw Jesus, who recorded, uh, you know, who basically said that he performed miracles, um, who proclaimed that he had risen from the dead, they were in a place to know whether or not these things were true. And given the accounts that we have of what happened to them, uh, you know, we conclude that it'd be unlikely, given their life after uh, 
Jesus' death, that they would have continued saying these things knowing what had happened to them. Since generally people do things for money, sex, or power in terms of them telling lies, and we have no indication that uh, these disciples benefited any of those three ways. In fact, we saw that they had a massive loss probably in terms of their possessions, uh, well, especially the Apostle Paul. The fact that that 19 hijackers flew planes into buildings on 9-11 demonstrates that your claim that people do things for money, sex, or lies, or or whatever, is, is not true. Power. I mean, or power. I, I mean, these guys didn't do that for any of those reasons. And if they would do something okay. for a much lesser re reason, then there's no reason to believe that, you know, people claiming to be disciples wouldn't have martyred themselves and who knows, maybe they were doing it for the notoriety. People do all kinds of things to get attention. Okay. They may have even been convinced it was true, but that doesn't mean that it actually was. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a fair point uh, with respect to the case of the terrorists. I guess I was thinking more in terms of cult leaders, uh, people like Joseph Smith or Jim Jones. But you are correct that that is an interesting case uh, with respect to the terrorists. Nonetheless, uh, they did believe fully that in doing what they did, that they would receive a massive reward in the afterlife uh, for what they did. But as I said before, there is a conceptual difference in that um, the disciples presumably would have had a greater opportunity to basically falsify um, you know, the, the idea of the resurrection. So unless they were deliberately fooling themselves, I think it's a different case than uh, you'd have with the terrorists. I don't see that it's different at all. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's martyring yourself for something that you b both believe and want to proliferate. Yeah, and if you, if in each, either case, they believe they were gonna get some reward in an afterlife. Yeah. Uh, yes, but I, I guess if you're talking about, say, the original companions of Muhammad, I think that would be a closer analogy. Uh, and that's what I would say is probably more appropriate is that the companions of Muhammad, they gained a lot of power through following him. Uh, you know, they often gained many uh, wives and many people that they had sex with uh, through their conquest. So, and yes, there was some persecution, but they're, they're also using the idea of looking at money, sex, and power. Uh, if you look at the original disciples of Muhammad, you would see that they had a lot of uh, reasons uh, to, um, to lie and to make up stories. Whereas if you look at the accounts of the original disciples of Jesus, you did see a lot of persecution. And I guess my point was that given the claims they're recorded to have made, um, they would have had to have been completely diluted because they had, um, we have good reason to believe that they had given up their lives. Uh, I, I have, you may have a good reason to believe it, but I have no good reason to believe this. And here's, um, I, I actually want to wrap this call up because we got several other callers on the line here. Um, okay. We've only got about another half an hour, but here's the problem I have with your claims, Kevin. You, you've already decided that this event happened. And now you're reasoning backwards to come up with the evidence to support it. And that's exactly backwards from how it's supposed to work. So your, your whole argument here is just an assumption that this is true and then bootstrapping anything you can onto it to make it appear real. Yeah, I think before you try to figure out if something was supernatural or miraculous, you need to first step back and decide whether this thing really happened or not. And you know, and I don't agree that uh, the biblical scholars have a consensus on that. If you know, you mentioned Bart Ehrman, I would suggest reading Richard Carrier. Um, yeah. I'm not a biblical scholar, so I'm not prepared to to make that argument. But you know, as a skeptic. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is say, you know, really, how do we know that this actually happened and it's not just a story that's been carried forth? Yeah, and there's, there's another book out there um, by a guy named Earl Doherty that's called The Jesus Puzzle um, that's very interesting. Um, and, and it actually argues, it, it, 
Doherty's a, a mythicist, but he's a mythicist for good reasons, not for the some of the crap reasons that other people come up with. Um, but you know, those are whether you know whether somebody's a mythicist or not. Um, looking at how he um, examines some of these claims um, certainly is very informative. And if you if you like having your faith challenged, that's probably a good book. And also Carrier. So okay. All right. So that's I'm good. Well, thank thanks for the call, and I'm gonna let you go now. So have a good day. Okay, you too. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, Kevin.